Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot. Where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Welcome home, Brains. There's only one requirement to hang out on the edge, is that you open your big brain and close your small mind. Did you bring your thinking caps? It's time to put them on, because the conversation starts Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. You're here at the spot, the place where the conversation is pointed. The guests are sharp. There she is. And the responses are never dull. Here we are back at the edge with Moon Sade. Did I say it right? Said. Moon Sade. Moon. Okay. I'm thinking of the singer. <laughs> Moon Sade. And we're going to talk about overwhelmed parents, burnout, uh, being a parent that has a child with special needs, but also realizing much later in life that you have some special needs of your own. How do we balance that? Work, life, be happy, but also be a, uh, a voice for that community. So we're going to talk to Moon about that and a whole lot more. Welcome. How are you today? Thank you for having me on your show. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I can't complain about nothing. Not yet. The day's just getting started. <laughs> so thank you again for being here. Can you tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world? Uh, I'm an autism parenting coach and breakthrough consultant. Um, I work with parents, overwhelmed parents of autistics. Uh, I help them to maintain positivity, balance, and calm despite the challenges that come every single day parenting their autistic children. And that's quite a lot because the challenges are not the same. You know, I can think back, I don't know, I'm 61. I could think in the last 10 years, there has been a spike in diagnosis in the areas of autism. Mm -hmm. Uh, it used to be where people would say, oh, the child is a little slow or they're a little special or they're a little withdrawn or they're shy. But now this is a full on diagnosis. I'm trying to frame this, not judge it. So I'm going to be asking questions. So I'm asking for your clarification. Okay, brain, so you don't be getting all crunchy. <laughs> when you talk about autism, would that be under the heading of mental health? It does come under the heading of mental health, yes, because autism is a neurological condition, so it affects the brain and the way that the brain processes um, information, the way that it processes everything in the world, but it also affects the way that the body processes information, and that is because of how the brain actually processes the way that your body senses things the way that your body responds to things. So it does come under mental health because it's all about how the brain works. Okay. Um, explain the term neurodivergent because a lot of people are using that term now. Okay, so everybody is um, neurodiverse in a sense. We all are neurological beings. So our brain directs the way that we do things. There's neurotypical people and for neurotypical people, the simplest example that I can use, which I use very often with my own children, but also with my clients, is if you want to go from point A to point B, neurotypical people will often look at point A, point B, and find the straightest path to go from point A to point B. And that's it. It's simple. It's straightforward. I'm going from here to there. This is what I need to do. Neurodivergent people will look at going from point A to point B but how they get there is very different. Every one of them will go on a different journey to get from point A to point B. And that I, I refer to that as going on an adventure. So they will stop along the way. They might find something interesting. They might go up a path. They might go down a path. They might see something else that distracts them and takes them off on a different tangent. They might find that point B is hidden behind something else so they can't see it clearly and then they need a little bit of help to find where point b is so it's not as simple or as straightforward as a straight line from point a to point b and that's what neurodivergent is it's about how the brain 
doesn't work as simply as straightforward. Right. Now, another challenge is that I hear that people have a combination of things, maybe autism and ADHD. Yeah. That can be, you know, that could be uh, challenging to try to figure out at what particular time, what is impacting them, how to sue them, uh, how to medicate, all of those things. Those can be big challenges as well. Yes. Uh, parenting and autistic is a huge challenge because autism itself is not straightforward. When the best way that I can describe autism is if you think of a buffet and you think of every autistic person as having a plate and they go to this buffet and they have different parts of this buffet on their plate. So all of them will have different aspects of it, but they'll have it in different combinations. And each element that they have is a different part of the spectrum. So some might, some might be very detailed. Some might have sensory issues. Some might have sense, uh, taste issues. Some might have sensitivity to smell. Some might be very, very creative, but they all have different elements to it. And then that's how their brain works. And then they have co-occurring conditions. So then there are autistic people that have OCD. So they're very, very conscious of how things are done. And, it, you know, um, switch on a light three times and switch it off three times to make sure that it's turned on or it's turned off. Some have anxiety. Some have uh, medical conditions that go with that. If they have ADHD, their brain works differently and autism and ADHD don't necessarily go well together, which then causes conflict in their own brain because at times ADHD people, their brains sometimes work really fast and they go hyper thinking into something, but then the autistic part of their brain needs to focus on detail and that's a conflict in their own brain and for parents to figure how how to work with that it's a lot when you're not sure which part of your child's brain is working at that time. It's a lot just with you explaining it because to have patience and, you know, there are parents that shy away from this. There yes. are parents that suppress it. There are parents that shame. Yes. There are parents that are just ignorant to it. And all ignorance means brains is not knowing. It doesn't mean that they're stupid, but they have to learn. So, and this is a very general statement. What would be an indication that you might need to take your child in for further testing? I know everybody is different, um, but just what are some of the things that might raise a red flag? Um, there are common indicators that you can look out for. So things like the way that your child develops, sometimes their speech developmental delays. So they may not speak as um, on, on the milestones that they're supposed to meet as they develop. They might be children that don't like to socialize with other children. So they like to play very much by themselves and they find that being with other children, the noise is too much. They don't like the noise, the chaos of other children play and that's too much for them so that would be something that you need to pay attention to if your child feels particularly stressed um, I know that eye contact is one that they talk about a lot that children on the spectrum don't make eye contact I can tell you that that's not necessarily an indicator my children both make great eye contact and always have um, so and they're both on the spectrum. So that's not necessarily an indicator. Um, autistic children have great imagination, but they might they might like to line things up. And again, you have to be careful about how you look for that because lining things up doesn't necessarily mean line it up in a straight line. I've worked with parents where they didn't notice that their child was lining things up in the sense that they were stacking everything that they came across just built it into towers and that was their way of lining things up it was just a stack as high as they could build it um, they like order in in a sense they like routine so if your child 
if you suddenly change what you're doing in a day and your child has a very very great difficulty in adapting to that that's something that you can you need to start paying attention to if you're supposed to go to the park and then you decide I'm not going there today I'm deciding to go to the supermarket instead and your child can't adapt to that change and it's a big issue that's things that you need to start paying attention to because those are the key indicators that there's something here that needs to be looked into okay so brains be patient and be very observant um, I know once upon a time that uh, a teacher in one of my daughter's schools says, well, you know, you might want to check uh, and see if your, you know, your daughter is on the spectrum for autism. And I'm saying, well, what you're explaining to me is happening at school. I'm not seeing that happening at home consistently. You know, kids do all kinds of stuff. She said, well, she doesn't sit in her chair. She doesn't focus during reading time. She's up doing this. You know, she's distracted and all that. Okay, well, I get it, but she could be disruptive as well. Come to find out, she wasn't on the spectrum. She had um, eye problems. She couldn't see. She couldn't read the words. So the other children were reading much faster than her, and she was embarrassed. And so instead of going through that, she caused a distraction. So be very careful in being labeled and labeling your children. Uh, based upon what the newfound information is, because kids are still kids. They cannot explain to you because they don't have the language. They don't have the experience. So that's where you need to check it out as a parent and be involved. Go visit the classroom. Sit in there for a while. Sit in the back of the room or look through the windows so the child doesn't even know that you're there so that they're not performing any differently. What are they active? Are they playing baseball? Are they, you know, again, speech? All these things are very important. But you told me that you speak about your situation, your personal situation. You have two children, which are two totally different individuals from the onset. Yes. But them being on the spectrum, being autistic um, is difficult. But you also found out that you are also neurodivergent. Tell us a little bit about that. And you found out and was diagnosed at a much more mature age. Yes, I'm still going through the process of formal diagnosis, which um, I think everywhere in the world, the waiting lists take forever to work through. Um, but self-diagnosis is absolutely and totally valid. So any, any adult who feels that they are neurodivergent and have gone through there's a lot of online testing with reputable agencies um, that you can go through and if those come back as valid self-diagnosis is valid um, so that's where I started and yes my my journey to neurodivergence actually started through my children being on the spectrum and as in, it was about four or five years ago where they started saying Mom, you know, you do this like we do, or have you noticed that you're like this? And it's very similar to either this child or that child. Mm. And it got me thinking. And I started actually observing things about myself. Um, <laughs> when I look back, it makes a lot of sense. So I went down the self-diagnosis route and found that many different characteristics of myself do actually come through as being autistic and ADHD. But it's very different for women than it is for men. And that's something that people need to be very aware of. The way that women present on the spectrum, girls and women, is different to boys and men. We are much more capable of masking and the way that our, our characteristics and our traits present themselves are very different and even our characteristics and our traits are different so we're more capable of managing different things that men are not capable of managing we're capable of doing things and we <laughs> I don't mean the lab but do you think <laughs> um we adapt we learn it's I don't know it's part of our DNA I think part of the the women the nurturing the mothers it's what we do so we learn in many ways to overcome things 
and a lot of our characteristics and traits fall by the wayside because we we think that they're just elements that we need to overcome and as women we constantly feel that we need to overcome things oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's... And it's just, you know, they say it just comes with the territory, you know, I'm tired, I'm overwhelmed, I've got brain fog, I'm, you know, yeah. I'm crying, it's my hormones. So there's a lot of other contributing factors that we can disguise yeah. and not really get to the root cause of this. Well, bravo for you for, you know, taking that, uh, taking that step to get self-diagnosed so that you can heal. Now, is this a, um, a, uh, situation or uh, condition that can be assisted with medication is it talk therapy I know that my niece works with autistic uh, children and she sits in the classroom with them but she also goes to their home and does work with them I don't know exactly what what she does but she's a clinical therapist so does that I mean does that help I'm sure it helps because they're recommending it but is this in conjunction with medication or Autism itself can't be treated. Um, it's not something that you can medicate, but symptoms of it, like the anxiety, if it's extreme, um, certain elements of it, there are the co-occurring conditions that might need medication, those can be medicated, but it's not something that you can medicate away. Um, it is, autism is a contribute, it's a combination of genetic and environmental factors. So it comes to you through your DNA, through your genetics, and it's not something that you can ever just get rid of or that you can talk your way out of through therapy. Talking therapies help in the sense that they help you to understand how your brain works. But fundamentally, this is how your brain works, and it's not going to change. All that you can do is you can learn how to adapt. You can learn how to work with your brain you can learn how to teach your brain to make certain things easier for you. So like we all do, we learn strategies, we learn tools like we do in life. And, and that's, that's what you the, learn. That's where like my niece would come in as a facilitator, a counselor in that yeah. situation. So now yeah. you've uh, stepped out and extended the olive branch to parents that are yes. overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. You know. Where do you begin? Because I'm, I'm going to bring up some really touchy things. You know, in situations like this, yes, I'm picking on you men. I'm sorry, men brains. They don't, again, they're not the mother. They It doesn't necessarily go with the territory. They're the hunter, the gatherer, the provider. All that. It can put a lot of stress on a marriage. Uh, there can be a lot of competition between children. I had one parent on my show that the one child uh, despised the other one because the one needed special attention. And so, okay, what about me? You don't care about me. You don't love me. And then the self-care, taking care of yourself, not having the burnout. You got to go to work. You got to pay for these things. You got to deal with those people. The school is calling because your child is disruptive. Yeah. In your own mind, you've got brain fog, so now you're going to have complications on the job. And then the intimacy between the, the, the partners. I mean, you know, everybody want to be down with the get down. Everybody wants to be hugged and kissed and loved. And, you know, the kids sent off to the sitter. What, what do you do with these parents? How do you, you know, begin to help them figure out a strategy and a plan for the burnout? I have a series of coaching programs. and. In my coaching programs, we address all of these at different stages and in different ways. So the first thing that we work on is you, because the, the coach, the person that comes to me to be coached, they are the fundamental person. So um, your listeners, your brains would understand what I'm talking about in terms of a family unit. My coaching programs are for family units. Um, when I start coaching a person, I'm coaching that person to try and make sure that their family unit stays a family unit. Mm -hmm. That's my ultimate aim is to make sure that they are they everything that I do is for the family unit. So the person who comes to me is the linchpin. 
and where you mentioned men are hunter gatherers yes I've got within my program fathers who have come to me because their wives are not the nurturing mothers in this instance and unfortunately the world has changed in that respect where mothers are not feeling that they need to be the ones taking care of their children as much as they used to and I've got these dads now struggling with my wife is not present for my child and my child doesn't feel that they can go to their mom for this or that so help me and whether you're the mom or the dad the struggle is still real and the overwhelm is still real and you are the linchpin because you've come to me and you've said I need help so you are the foundation around which everything then starts building and we talk about looking after yourself and we work we work into some self-care but then we talk about observation and then that is the key point is when you start observing your child and you start looking at how you can put into place tiny little things that they may not notice, but that helps. And then how you bring your partner into that relationship, how you bring other children into that, so that there's less of a, I get more attention, and they don't get that attention. And then that inequality in the relationship between your children lessens because there's more understanding and there's be there becomes a collective responsibility within the family and the stress well, kind of lessens there, coach coach what did you do why did and, and it's just a personal question why didn't you get your phd and your doctorate you spent <laughs> over really you spent over 25 years did you say about 25 years studying this your voice inflection is so calming and soothing i mean i guess with two children and and having it yourself, you understand that, you know, escalating and raising your voice is the last thing that you want to do. You want to try yeah. to stay even keeled. But I think yeah. that you would be one heck of a, you know, psychologist or a psychiatrist. But then sometimes that pigeonholes you. If yes. pigeonholes you, you, you're not able to be as creative, as uh, thought provoking or as vocal as you'd like to be because you've got this credential hanging over your head do you find that very much so yes um I am a qualified teacher so I have done almost 20 years in the secondary school system in the UK and but my doctorate as you put it comes from life experience I am the doctor of my life and 25 years of parenting my oldest and then when my youngest came along and he was diagnosed as well so that challenge and you know marriage and creating all of these things together so I'm not a single mother I have I have my husband I have my children and it's trying to work around that and keeping that family unit together and the reality is as much as I know my stuff I also still struggle with the overwhelm sometimes the challenges are still there for me and with my children I know that these challenges will change and they'll grow and there will be days when even I will sit there and go I don't know what to do but over the years I've learned to get up and put in place the strategies that we've created and find a way and that's what I help my clients to do okay so now you said you have a 25 year old son I does do. he still live at home? He does, yes. Okay. Um, do you think, on a broad scale, that he has mastered the task and the ability to be on his own? Um, he's almost there. Okay. I would say he's almost there. There are still a few things does that... He like, does he go to school? Does he have a job? So he's no just, um, he's one who I, I wouldn't, girlfriend, not yet. He's gone through the relationships. They haven't been really beneficial for him. So he's on a hiatus, as he calls it, from uh, women good, at the moment. Good for him, but you know what? <laughs> it's good that he has, uh, he's a, a gained the knowledge to know that, you know what, something about this doesn't feel right. 
let me step back. So, you know, kudos to you. That's, that's huge because you get into relationships, they become confrontational, they become conflicting. You're already trying to figure out, you know, what's going on in your own mind. And now this love factor or intimacy factor can confuse the whole thing, make things volatile. You know, it, it, it could be a mess. So, you know, I applaud him for saying, hey, you know what? I'm not ready for this right now. Let me back up. Bravo. Yeah. But yeah. what about working a job or maybe getting a, you know, getting an apartment? Um, do you think that he feels comfortable in those type of settings? Um, he's just finished his second degree at university. So he's taking some time now. Um He's doing an online course to kind of brush up on the actual practicalities of the degree that he's got. Mm -hmm. um, once he's done that, then yes, he'll consider looking for a job. That will require some support from our end. And that's a reality that I know he can do it, but it will need some support. We'll have to put in place supports for him so or that he can do it. He's super heady and bright and he can become an entrepreneur and start his own thing, you know? Oh, he, he's got the entrepreneurial ideas in his head already. So we are supporting him with that. He's got a couple of things going. Um, they're in the fledgling stages. Right now, our idea is not to push him into one thing or the other, because that's that's not the ideology that we work with. Um, the way that we bring up our children is that they are very bright, very capable, very able, intelligent human beings, and that it is our job to help them and nurture them and allow them to thrive in the way that is best suited to them. And that may not be the way that we see it right. going for right, them. Right. Well, so, I mean, that's the philosophy that all parents can incorporate is that it's not your life brains yeah, <laughs> you cannot a... relive your life vicariously through your children no matter how you want to orchestrate it no matter how you want to do it it's it's not you need to be supportive a good listener impactful teach them consequences you know uh but to be an independent contributor to society and to yeah. have a heart and to be kind and to have self-love and compassion for others those are just the fundamental staples of life. Do you find that your older and I'm, your older son has a fondness or compassion or protective element for your other child? Because you have two boys, right? Yes. So the older one, under, he understands that he is uh, autistic. He does. And yes. Whatever that framework looks like for him. Does he have an additional level of compassion for his brother, seeing that he's going through similar challenges? It gets really challenging at times. So yes, he understands that his younger brother is also on the spectrum, but because they're the way they present at times can be quite a conflict, they're not the same in so many ways. They have similarities, but they are so different that at times their differences conflict with each other. So in a certain situation, one will react in one way and the other reacts in a different way. And they don't quite, they can't quite understand why mm. the other is reacting in the way that they are, because it's just not computing for them in their brains. I'm reacting this way. Right. And subconsciously, it's like, but you're also on the spectrum. Shouldn't you be reacting in the same oh, way right, that I right, am? Right, 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 right. We're on the same team. You know, it seems like, <laughs> seems like we're doing it. But again, you play in two different positions. Yes. One's the quarterback. The other one's the wide receiver. So I yeah. get it. I get it. So, uh, well, you're in the UK. So that's soccer. I don't know the position. <laughs> so let's talk about some fun stuff, Moon. What do you do for yourself? I mean, you know. You got a 25 year old, you got another young adult, you got your husband over there. Do you bowl? Can you knit? Do you have a cat? What do you do for you? Um, we have two cats. <laughs> <laughs> so they are energetic and lively and keep us busy. Um, what do I do for me? I play Xbox. <laughs> really? You're a gamer? 
I do. Um, I have specific games, so I don't I don't like RPG games, which are role playing games. Um, I like racing games, cars. Mm. I love cars. Um, so yeah, I like racing games, and I play Xbox. <laughs> That's a great lead into some of my other fun questions. If you were a car, what car would you be? Oh, that's a really good question. If I was a car, what car would I be? I'd either be a really, really classic old car, mm. um, like Dean Martin's Porsche, the one that he crashed. Oh, sorry, not J uh, James Dean's Porsche, the one that he crashed in. Mm. Or I'd be a really fancy supercar, like a Lamborghini. Okay. If you were an appliance in the kitchen, what appliance would you be? If I were an appliance. Right now, if you ask me, I'd probably say the noisiest one. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, so, I'm normally very calm, so yeah. I think making noise would be good. <laughs> making noise would be good, yeah. I think I would probably be the teapot because I like to spout off. <laughs> <laughs> if you... Uh, had a magical wish yeah what would that be if i had a magical wish what would that be i would wish that i could reach as many people as i could with my message and i could help as many parents as i could so that as many autistic children in the world as possible could understand the absolute unique ability that they have and be able to thrive in a way that is best for them that would be my wish well, that's a beautiful wish. Can you play an instrument? I can play a piano, not very well, but I can. Well, that's and okay. a recorder. <laughs> okay, you know, because I know some uh, some autistic children that are brilliant. I have one that's a painter, uh, uh, an artist. I have another one that plays the. What does he play? He plays a trumpet. You're talking about a loud instrument, but I'm telling you can read music because there's other underlying gifts that are suppressed that these young people are, they're, they're trapped inside themselves. They yeah. want to come out. They want to be quote unquote normal. What is that anymore? Everybody's got a tick. Um, but they want to be in the mainstream. They don't want to be labeled. They don't want to be alienated. And it's very hard. And a lot of times they're bullied. Yes. How do you encourage parents with children with special needs against the bully? I say teach them karate. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want your kids to be, you know, aggressive or combative, but no. you don't want them to be a marshmallow either. No, you don't. Um, we've had to learn the hard way because my oldest was bullied very much in school. Um he wasn't diagnosed until he was 16. So a lot of wow. his early years in school, he was bullied. And the way that we dealt with it was helping him to understand first to control his own anger so that he didn't retaliate and get himself into trouble because that was just giving the bullies what they wanted. And the second was for him to understand that many bullies come from the perspective of fear. Mm -hmm. um, and when you couldn't see that it's people who are afraid, that actually gave him a sense of strength because if somebody is afraid of me, then I've got to be stronger than them because they want to bring me down. And that helped him to not be bothered by the bullies. In a, in a sense, that works. But when the bullying is physical, then it is very much for parents to step in and insist that something is done in the school. It is the school's responsibility. In the UK, we have a phrase, the duty of care. Schools have a duty of care for every child that comes into it. And that is the reality. Schools have a responsibility for every child that walks through their door, right. regardless right. of ability. Right. Well, that's you. That's good to know. And hurt people hurt people. You know, we don't know what's going on in that bully's household. Yeah. You know, this is an outlet for them. Yeah. Uh, and social media is just, did you allow your children on social media? 
I don't know. Because that can really throw a monkey wrench in everything that you're trying to do. They go off and get their thumbs working and it's a totally different thing. Yeah. So back to my fun questions. If you were a flower in the garden, what flower would you be? My instinct is to say a rose. You look like a rose. <laughs> Thank you. What's your favorite color? Blue and purple. I don't have one. I like blue and purple. Well, they're they're pretty they're pretty close. I'm looking at the beautiful artwork behind you, so it definitely speaks to blue and purple. And um, Moon, I just want to again express my gratitude um, that you have kind of put some things that you probably would have done in a different direction uh, on the shelf to coach these parents, to handhold them, to help them keep the family unit together, to stay strong because the struggle is real. And it doesn't seem that it's going away, but to be able to come on this podcast and provide people with options and choices and consultation and coaching um, outside of what you're already dealing with yourself and your two children and your spouse, I think it's commendable. So I want to thank you on behalf of me and my brains. Please tell them how to get in contact with you. Um, again, brains, anywhere in the world. She's in the UK. I'm in San Diego. See how quick and easy this is? She would love to talk to you. Um, maybe she has you know, an intake form. I don't know exactly what that would look like, but we definitely want you to reach out and talk to someone and figure out what your next steps are going to be. You need someone that's been there, done that, and wearing the t-shirt. And that's Moon. How do they get in contact with you? Thank you, April. So the easiest way to get in contact with me is to find me on Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, just search my name and friend me and then DM me. I don't have complicated forms. I know that parents don't have time to sit down and fill out forms and give me a whole lot of details. And I am very much a people person. I want to talk to you. I want to know what's going on in your life. So just DM me and let's have a conversation and find out what's going on with you and if I can help you in any way. And we can go from there. That's all you need to do. It's not complicated. See, she made it easy for you. <laughs> and that's what we need to do. Uh, try to make it a little a little simpler. What they say, make it simple, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Don't overthink it because it is what it is. And if you relax and settle into it, Believe me, you'll get the downloads, the support will come. Uh, people will want to work with you because they see your patience or they see your frustration and you're not taking it out in a hostile uh, type of way. You're really trying to work through these issues. So again, thank you so much. Brains, I need you to go in and love, like, share, plus subscribe, free please. I want to raise those numbers on that YouTube channel. Love, like, share, and subscribe. I'm going to put all of Moon's information in the show notes, as well as the back of the interview. Uh, again, I thank you from the bottom of my socks because my heart was just not deep enough. Thank you so much. And thank you, Brains, for listening. <laughs> Have a good day, Brains. <laughs>